British government left Singapore in 1960. Singapore was part of Malaysia, but in 1965, we became an independent country. Singapore achieved four things. No homeless, no more squatters, no poverty ghettos, and no ethnic enclaves. That means our three major races Chinese, Malay, and Indians, they are all mixed together. The city government must have the heart of a humanist, the head of a scientist, the eye of an artist. By 1985, Singapore basically became a modern city. Singapore can be a window to the future. We do have to ensure that our technology remains at the cutting edge. And uh, as a consequence of that, we do then develop things that may be useful to other countries. Yesterday's dreams, many of them hopefully, will become today's reality. And today's dreams will become tomorrow's reality. That is the nature of life. We want to test solutions that haven't been tested elsewhere. And we need to do so. Some people like to say uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And so for Singapore, that's absolutely true. If other people can't find a solution, we'll try and find it. I like to think that we can serve an example for the rest of uh, the world. It provides an inspiration for others uh, to do more. I think we're, we're happy to, to play that role. The more challenging part is not hardware, is actually education. Making sure that everyone, young, old, rich, not so rich, has access to these same tools. We need to make sure we don't have anyone or any segment of our society that's left behind. And that, I believe, is a key role for government. That's also part of the formula for happiness. I came to Singapore from America in 1969. Singapore government basically gave me the city as my urban laboratory. Singapore is a very high density area. So how do you create an illusion that it is not high density. I got the idea from Europe, the European chessboard. European chessboard, you have black square, white square, black square, and white square. So I put the high density housing in the black square, and white square, you put schools, gardens, sports field. And we extend the same idea to the whole city. When you plan the whole island, you make sure you keep as much natural area as you can so that you don't turn the whole island into an urbanized area. So we still have a lot of green area.
we have a large number of park area per person in Singapore despite our small land size and I think that has a huge effect on the well-being of people. We have a great quality of life here. From the very beginning, we decided to make it a metro line oriented city because everybody knows that the energy used by metro is much lower than cars. And this, we got inspiration from Paris and London. So today in Singapore, you can go almost anywhere by metro. When you get out of metro, you can get a bus to go to your house. The city must function very well. In fact, I asked a lot of foreigners who work in Singapore, why do you give up your big country to come to a small place like this? A hundred percent of them, within three seconds, say, because everything works here. More than 75% of the trips during rush hour is taken by public transport. For us, Autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles solve the sustainability issue and also provide excellent livability or transportation solutions to our citizens. Really, the vehicle that you see behind me, you can see that as a robot. The eyes of this vehicle are eight sensors. It also includes a GPS, which is a common feature of all our mobile phones. If you had asked five or ten years ago, driverless vehicles would have been more in the science fiction range. Some of these technologies would become available in the next two or three years at a very affordable cost. So by introducing most of the public transport using electric vehicles, we will reduce our CO2 emissions by almost 30 percent. And that is important from our Singapore's uh, Paris Agreement. Singapore will have a carbon tax in 2019. So the government will be imposing a fixed tax and that will drive the awareness of the Singaporean consumer. When the carbon tax was announced, I think most people felt that it was an excellent way forward. Uh, they were worried about industry, uh, about the petrochemical sector, but I think by and large people are accepting that we are just moving with the times. And uh, in fact, some would say Singapore is ahead of the curve when it comes to uh, implementing a carbon tax in the region. By converting oil fire plants into gas is already a, a major step in reducing carbon emissions in Singapore. But now the next step is actually adopt renewable energy. The most abundant energy is the sun. It can actually match our peak demand, which is still in the middle of the day, perfectly. The government has an initiative to install close to 350 megawatts of solar by 2020 to reach the COP21 initiatives. Solar energy is still the only promising source of renewable. We can roll out almost every household, every building, every land that we can put on with solar system. What we see happening now and over the next five or ten years is really digitalization merging with the energy sector. We constantly try and test new solutions. So smart technology is already prevalent in Singapore. Smart grid and smart metering provide a new set of opportunities for all industry players. It allows the consumers to be more aware of the consumer behaviour that they have as well as the impact to the environment. The enhanced knowledge about its own conceptions uh, will allow the customer 
uh, to better understand its needs, to better understand its profile, and to share that with third parties, that might be the distribution operators, that might be uh, the utilities, in order to start thinking about services that are linking the consumption side with the renewable variable production side. For smart meters, we have some test beds going on in some parts of Singapore where many young people live and I think they're also more interested in measuring their energy usage. They're open to looking at consumption patterns and changing their behaviours over time. There is a lot of potential if we actually empower the consumer with data. So smart grid um, and also smart um, metering is one of the key requirements that we can actually maximise the solar power here in Singapore. A microgrid is basically a system that allows you to collect the renewable energy that is widely available in Southeast Asia. So you harvest the energy from the sun, the wind, and the sea, and you make it available for electrification of remote islands in Southeast Asia. So we are namely addressing the needs of three countries, uh, focusing on the Philippines, uh, Myanmar, and Indonesia. The expertise we are developing in managing decentralized energy will be transferable to other applications, such as uh, smart districts, smart buildings, uh, any kind of application for decentralized energy management in uh, uh, tropical megacities, for instance. Oftentimes, there's a lot of research, but this does not necessarily lead to solutions which are useful to the community. So ultimately, the community is our stakeholders. Typically, in waste management in many countries, we would collect the waste, we would incinerate the waste, and then we would dispose of the ash that comes out from the incinerators. But in Singapore's context, there is a major issue because we are a very small country. We don't have the space to dispose of the ash. Now, in our case, we vitrify the ash, meaning that we make glass out of the ash, and then the ash would be safe for reuse. So the ash can go into uh, construction materials, it can be the floor and the roads. Our children, when they go to school, they would be educated on the need to look at water and, in addition, energy in a very serious manner. We do have a lot of rain. This is a tropical country. The problem is we don't have sufficient space to store the water that falls down on us. So this must mean that we have to be able to conserve water. We have to be able to use the water in a prudent manner and reduce wastage. We have very low water wastage here in uh, Singapore. So on the one hand, we reclaim water from used water. On the other hand, we produce fresh water from saline water. We do have enough resources to take our children into the future. Now that's important. It's not just about us, but also about our children going forward. The government thinks long and hard about the next generation. Every decision that is made is a long-term decision. When I planned the 1991 concept plan, uh, we had 3.2 million people. So I was afraid that if we don't build to a high enough density, we will run out of land very quickly. So I planned for 100 years, from 1991 to 2091. And after talking to a lot of people, we think that it will grow to 5.5 million by 2091. Even though we increase the population to 10 million, we will still keep all the important green area, all the water bodies, then you can continue to use the chessboard system to increase the new population, not in one area, but you know, spread it out. Each time you plan, 
you must use a lot of skill, a good team of professionals to create good plan. It's like a conductor to an orchestra. You have to create music, create art.